Hi, this is Bob Harrington from Stanford University on Medscape Cardiology and the Heart.org. Thanks for joining us today. Over the last couple of months, or maybe longer than that, we've interviewed on this show a couple of cardiologist or physician authors who have been commenting on some of the issues of the time, whether that's related to the electronic health records, as in our discussions with Bob Wachter, or it's in the revolution that's taking place with things like wearables and patient-centric data, as was the conversation with Eric Topol. These have been shows that have been well-received and conversations, I think, that were useful to the community to think about, to have a frame of reference from not just the daily practice of medicine, but how some of the bigger issues in society around digital health, wearables, electronic records, et cetera, might influence the practice of medicine. Well, today we're also going to interview a physician author but with a little bit of a different approach to some of the issues within medicine and really trying to get at some of the issues of how do physicians and other clinical providers take what we know from the literature, from scientific studies that have been done, and use some combination of an understanding of statistics coupled with an art of what we know about caring for other human beings in a way that ends up with really first-rate medical care. And this author not only wondered how we do that, but also how do we begin to think about teaching that to our trainees, to our students, our residents, our fellows, et cetera. So I'm really pleased to have with me today the author of the book, The Science of the Art of Medicine, which is now just coming out in its second edition. And the author is Dr. John Brush. John is a professor of medicine at Eastern Virginia Medical School. He's a practicing cardiologist in Norfolk, Virginia. And John and I are friends and colleagues through his service as a recent board of trustee member for the American College of Cardiology. So, John, thanks for joining us here today on Medscape Cardiology. Thanks very much, Bob. It's a pleasure being here, and I look forward to our conversation. Well, John, let's jump right into it. What made you write this book? Well, Bob, I think one of the origins of this book was actually my work with the American College of Cardiology related to quality of care and quality of care initiatives. I was chairman of the Quality Strategic Direction Committee for three years and really got thinking about quality and started really thinking about, well, why do people make errors? What leads to good judgment? What leads to bad judgment? And that led me to stumble, really, on this whole cognitive psychology literature. When I was in college, there was no such thing as cognitive psychology. It was mostly behavioral psychology. And this field of cognitive psychology has really risen in the past 30 years. Cognitive psychologists are interested in understanding how people make decisions. And Doctors make decisions every single day, and yet we don't teach anything about cognitive psychology and we don't learn anything about it in medical school. And so it really seemed like it was a relevant area to start to think about. And so I jumped into it. I became a student. I taught myself cognitive psychology. I bought book after book after book and just decided I was going to read about it. What cognitive psychologists have figured out is that we're not purely rational like we think we are. But we make mistakes. We, make, we fall into typical traps. We have biases. And that we do that because we use heuristics or mental shortcuts to try to make rapid decisions under conditions of uncertainty. So if you think about it, that's what doctors do every single day, make rapid decisions under conditions of uncertainty. So we use heuristics every day, but we're prone to biases. And so I wanted to learn more about it myself. And then the more I read about it, you know, I, I was sort of jokingly saying to my wife, you know, I could write a book on this stuff. And I just kept reading on it. And then I stumbled on this iBook authoring tool and I figured out, you know, that it's actually easy to write an iBook, easier than I thought. And so I said, well, I am going to write a book about it. I started out writing this book. I thought it was going to take me five years. It took me about three months because it was just, I was so consumed by this. I thought it was just so interesting. Before you dive further, let me ask you a couple of things about cognitive psychology because it is 
interesting that you took this observation of people making errors and then did the deeper dive, which I applaud you for. I'm thinking of some other authors in this area that some of our listeners might know about. Dan Ariely from Duke and the book Predictably Irrational. Would you put that in the context of cognitive psychology? He's an example of a well-known cognitive psychologist, Daniel Kahneman, who wrote Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, and is from Princeton, a very prominent writer in cognitive psychology. A guy named Gerdgut Gerenzer in Germany has written books on risk and how to evaluate risk, and so basically how to think about probability. His books were very influential for me. This guy named Herbert Simon was a, a computer scientist in Pittsburgh, and he is generally thought of as the father of cognitive psychology. He was at Carnegie Mellon. Cognitive psychology also is referred to as behavioral economics, by the way. And Herbert Simon has won the Nobel Prize in economics. Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize in economics for their work in cognitive psychology. So, you know, all of these people really reading their work and understanding what they have been doing sort of outside of medicine is absolutely transportable to medicine and our understanding of how we make rapid decisions each day. Yeah, that's where I really wanted you to get at for the audience that I find it not just interesting, but potentially useful to read outside of medicine, as you did, to then be able to bring those ideas back into how we think about medicine. And I think you've hit upon something, which is what actually are we teaching our students, our residents? We don't teach them how people actually make decisions, as you said, in this field of behavioral economics or cognitive psychology, but yet you've well described what a clinician does every day. Let me ask you, John, you said that the iBook was an easy thing to do or easier than you thought. Why did you pick a book and not what an academic cardiologist like you often does is writes a commentary for an article, for a journal, um, gives a lecture on the topic. Why did you go right into a book? That's a pretty big leap. Well, I think the topic is too broad to cover in a single lecture or a single commentary. I actually did write a series of blog posts that were posted on uh, cardioexchange.org. Harlan Krumholtz invited me to do that, and it was very helpful because it enabled me to, to really collect my thoughts but also sort of test out ways of explaining this. And, you know, one of the challenges is explaining the subject matter because it's outside medicine and you're bringing a new area to people's attention. I'd done this series of blog posts. I did a series of lectures for our residents here in Norfolk. And I have to tell you that the very first lectures that I did on this utterly failed because they were dull. They were boring. And so I have to figure out how to make it interesting, make it appealing, because if you discuss it in the setting of patient and you study it on rounds, it's absolutely fascinating. But if you talk about it in isolation, it's just like a statistics course in isolation where you're not really dealing with some subject matter it becomes too dry. And so you have to make it interesting. And the way you make it interesting is related to patients. And so I started collecting sort of examples and thinking about how to use examples, simple examples. And there's simple examples in cardiology all over the place. One of the things that's, I think, interesting is that cardiology is the ideal place to teach medical reasoning because we almost get immediate feedback. You can sort of put your money down and make your bets as to whether somebody's having a myocardial infarction or whether somebody has heart failure or whether somebody has a pulmonary embolus. Generally, by the next day, you find out. And so you get this immediate feedback where you can train your intuition. But then you can also use so many of the sort of the numerical things that we have, troponin levels, D-dimers, stress tests, and what have you. And so you can start to develop estimates of probability so that you can start to calibrate your intuition. And there's no better place in medicine than cardiology to do that as an exercise. So one of the things I love about the book, John, is that you do spend some time, particularly at the beginning of the book, going through the basics of statistics that help us in the practice of medicine. And one area where you spend a bit of time is talking about Bayes' theorem and uh, this general notion that while we use both frequentist statistics and Bayesian statistics in medicine, in many ways, clinicians, we're natural Bayesians, aren't we? We are, but we don't think hard enough about what that means. We sort of wander into being Bayesians. It's a good idea to step back, dig a little bit deeper, and ask exactly what that means. The cognitive psychologists tell us that we make mistakes by deviating from a normative mode of thinking 
in two ways. One, we either do things that are illogical, or number two, we make bad probability estimates. So I wanted to really think about the logic of what we do, as well as think about probability. I talk a little bit in the book about deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning, but really what we do is something called abductive reasoning, where we reason to the most plausible hypothesis. Most of the time, we don't ever really know. Somebody comes in with heart failure, we think it may be untreated hypertension or alcoholism or whatever, but we don't really know. We just have to leave it at that, but we reason towards the most plausible hypothesis. But then what we have to do all the time when we're using Bayesian reasoning is we're using probability estimates. And so knowing something about probability is a good idea. And we think that we know about probability because we play cards, we throw dice, we play games of chance all the time, and we think we know about probability. But probability is simple and complex and complementary and cumulative probability and conditional probability. Bayesian reasoning is all about conditional probability. So we actually never do the calculations, but we think like Bayesians, but we never do the calculations because what we do is we use a heuristic called anchoring and adjusting. Anchoring and adjusting is sort of a natural way that you use Bayesian reasoning where you come up with an anchor, which is your pretest probability, and you adjust that anchor, you adjust that pretest probability based on new information to give you a post-test probability. So we kind of intuitively know how to use this heuristic called anchoring and adjusting, and that's actually what we do in practice rather than pulling out our calculator and then calculating the Bayesian probabilities. But it is interesting, isn't it, John? What you're describing in part is what makes the great clinician. And the great clinician has to have a grounding in statistical methods, has to understand what probability actually is and how one thinks about it. At the same time, the great clinician has to have a body of experience upon which to anchor that probability. And then finally, the great clinician has to be observant and trust his or her intuition. Is that a reasonable way to put it together? Absolutely. When you think back on your colleagues or maybe your mentors who just really just seem to get it, I think one characteristic that describes the person who just seemed to get it is that they made good bets. They had a good sense of what's most likely, what's least likely, and they just made good bets. They were savvy about how they made those calculations. They had good intuition about how they made those judgments. How do you teach that? Well, you can teach people about the processes and give them an idea of where they want to be at the end of the day. If you can break it down just a little bit, I think it helps. The other thing you can do is use simple numbers. If you can simplify the numbers, you can use the numbers to calibrate your intuition. Now, there's something in medicine that we are leaving out. We talk all the time about sensitivity and specificity, and yet when you ask uh, physicians, give me a quick definition of sensitivity and specificity, they're not going to be able to do it. You lose track of what's in the numerator and what's in the denominator. People get all balled up with those definitions. Ends up sensitivity is a true positive rate, specificity is a true negative rate, and so that's a little bit more descriptive of what you're actually talking about but there's something even better, and that's likelihood ratios. Because positive likelihood ratio is the probability of something divided by the probability that something is not there. And so it's the evidence for something divided by the evidence against it. And so it's a dimensionless number. You don't even have to keep track of what's in the numerator and denominator because it's a dimensionless number, but likelihood ratios are incredibly powerful. And so if you're trying to teach a trainee, how important is a positive troponin? How important is a positive nuclear stress test? How important is a D-dimer? If a D-dimer is negative, is it an important piece of information? The answer is yes. It's a very important negative piece of information. But if it's positive, it's not quite so strong. That's because the positive likelihood ratio for a D-dimer is like 2, and the negative likelihood ratio is like 0.1. So, you know, you can use likelihood ratios basically to really hone your intuition, to calibrate your intuition, which I think would be very useful when you're trying to impart years of wisdom to new trainees. You can't wait for 30 years for them to finally get it. You want them to get it on day one. And so being able to enable them to hone their intuition using things like likelihood ratios, I think, are very important. Number needed to treat is another one, and we've been talking about diagnosis so far, but for therapeutics, for treatment, you need to try to figure out how to calibrate your intuition on treatment decisions. So the inverse of the absolute risk reduction is number needed to treat. The smaller, the better. And if you've got some sense of what's a good number needed to treat, then suddenly you can calibrate your intuition about what's really important 
and what's not so important. Beta blockers and, and aspirin and ACE inhibitors are really important. Maybe 2B3A antagonists are less important. And number needed to treat gives you a way to sort of gauge the importance of therapeutic interventions. Yeah, no, and I love the direction you're going, which is to take what we do and recognize that there's a science behind what we do. Let's say for a lot of the therapeutics you just mentioned, that there are clinical trials that tell us or inform us about what those numbers needed to treat are, what the numbers needed to harm are. But then, as you've rightly said, the art in medicine comes around understanding when you make that bet as to who is likely to benefit from this particular therapy. And as we, you know, we're not there yet in this era of precision health of being able to say, I know based on your characteristics, which may include genomic characteristics, that you are more likely to benefit from this and less likely to benefit from that. But you're helping move us to that. And what I love about this, John, is you're helping us think about a framework for teaching it. And that's where I want to get to as we close out over the next couple of minutes. You clearly wrote this as a teacher to students. And whether that's a teacher to a colleague like me or to some of your residents and students and fellows, in some ways it doesn't matter. What's been your reactions from uh, the student community, student being broadly defined? So I use it to teach internal medicine residents. I have an internal medicine resident with me each month. I have a new one. We have 12 locally and 12 months of the year, so I have a new one each month. And what I have them do is I have them read the book at night, and we talk about the book during the day, but we talk about the book in the context of taking care of patients. And so in a way, it's sort of an inverted classroom where they're getting the lecture from me by reading the book. I mean, it would be odd for me to sit and lecture them on these kind of things, but we talk about it in the setting of a real patient. We'll go in and see a patient in the emergency room who's short of breath. And maybe our pretest probability that it's heart failure may be 50-50, and so the pretest odds is one. So you can then multiply that by the likelihood ratios of P&D and orthopnea and RALS and S3 gallop and congestion on a chest X-ray. And so you end up with a post-test probability. You can calculate it in your head what your post-test probability is. And so when we do that during the day, it suddenly makes uh, you know what they've read at night very real. So I've gotten really, really good feedback on that. Residents, you know, it's just like one of those things where you hit your forehead and go, oh, now I get it. Yeah, that's now it. <laughs> and you can see the light bulb turning on, and I think they just really appreciate it. The other thing is, is that, you know, it helps them get a handle on uncertainty. Uncertainty scares the heck out of us when we're in training. You know, some of us sort of run away from it and create this illusion of certainty and what have you. But let's face it, the uncertainty and the ambiguity of medicine scares the heck out of all of us. But it really scares people as you're training. You just don't know whether you don't know it or whether it's unknown to everybody. Uh, you just don't know the level of uncertainty of things. And so by addressing that straight on, and by trying to get a handle on how you can reason through that uncertainty and how you can move from a place where you don't know to a place where you have a better idea, but also you understand that some things you'll never know for sure, but you got to get as close as you can. I mean, I think that it takes a little bit of the pressure off and I think helps them grasp what the challenge is learning as much as they possibly can and getting as much experience as they can so that they can put it all into action in a way that's systematic and organized and tends to make sense. John, my last question for you. What have you learned from this? First of all, I've learned so much about cognitive psychology, about probability, about logic, and I think that that's helped me be a better decision maker in general, even beyond, you know, medicine, but certainly I think it's helped me become a better clinician and certainly a better teacher. I, I've been able to articulate what I'm thinking and how I'm thinking in a way that I think it makes a little bit better sense to students. What I've learned, though, is that we're not teaching this, and we're also not testing on it. It's much easier to test on content. You can turn some, you know, medical fact into a multiple choice question a whole lot easier than you can, you know, trying to figure out whether somebody actually gets it and is able to put the knowledge into action. Because really what we want, we don't want to just impart knowledge. We want to impart wisdom. We want to be able to use knowledge wisely. And now we've just got this rush of information that's coming at us from every direction by, you know, over the Internet and in so many different ways. 
Somehow or another, we need to turn that information into knowledge and knowledge that helps us get closer to the truth. And to do that, we, we've got to learn how to use the knowledge wisely. And so as a community, as a community of physicians, as a community of professionals, and, and that also includes a community of academicians, we need to really think, well, how do we teach this stuff? How do we test it? How do we develop competencies in this area? For me, it's created a whole new way of looking at medical education and really what matters and what we really ought to be concentrating on. This has been a fascinating conversation, John, and I applaud you for uh, taking the initiative not just to learn the background material, but to write the book and share it with the rest of us. And I certainly recommend to our listener audience uh, John Brush's book, The Science of the Art of Medicine. You can get it through iBook, so you can get a hard copy of it. So my guest today, uh, thank you, has been Dr. John Brush, a professor of medicine at Eastern Virginia Medical School and a practicing cardiologist in Norfolk, Virginia. John, thanks for joining us on Medscape Cardiology. Thanks very much, Bob.